Praise the Lord. Here we go. Jesus loves little children. Amen? Okay, we are going to talk about sin. <laughs> Just a hard segue right into it, all right? Um, man, we are in, I don't know, week five, six, something like that, six, I think. And uh, we've been in three weeks talking about sin. We're going to be in four more weeks of talking about sin. Yay! Come on now. All right. <clears throat> Church, we're doing this because Paul is doing this, because God was doing this, amen? And uh, we, we need this. This is good word for our edification, for our growth, for our maturity, and for our coming into the fullness of Jesus. We need all of his word, not just the parts we like, amen? Uh, there are some verses we like to hang on our refrigerator. I don't know many of you who have this one there, but if you do, that's great. Good for you. You should. Uh, but we're going to deal today with God's righteous treatment of humanity and their failure to, failure to follow him. Um, church, God is just to punish wickedness. Amen? God will reveal to us that he does not show partiality in how he deals with sin, that God, in fact, actually deals with sin. And today, as we're looking at this, we're going to see how God has, in, in, in his own self, maintained his righteousness by dealing with the unrighteousness of humanity, that he's not showing partiality, he's dealing with everybody the same. It's going to be a powerful thing. And so I want to warn you this morning at the outset that God is going to be moving on our hearts today, but it might not be the way that you're expecting. Okay? Church, God is going to be pressing on our thoughts that make us think we're good with him based on the good things that we do. Church, it can be easy for us as Christians to think that we're good with God because we go to church. Because we're here sitting in this room right now. Because occasionally we turn on a podcast and because we sprinkle in a little Jesus music here and there, we can think that because we do that, we are somehow good with God, and if that's you this morning, I'm praying for you that you would lean into this passage with all your heart, that you would open up your heart to hear the word of God, that he would speak to you, that you would lean into Jesus. And so as a, as a body this morning, as a collected body of Christ, we're going to lean into Jesus. Amen? Amen? This is a good word. Praise him for it. Let's, uh, let's grab your Bibles if you wouldn't stand. We're going to read from Romans chapter 2. We're, we're, we're six weeks in, and I've already extended the sermon uh, series by two weekends, and so uh, there's an updated reading plan on your notes page. If you want to check that off, you can start checking again now, all right? Here we go. Chapter 2, verse 6. We'll go through 16 today. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's 
pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly this morning. needing every word that you have to speak to us. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that your word would be alive to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that your spirit would be so present in the room, searching hearts, revealing truth, Lord God. God, calling the lost to be found. God, calling the dead to life today. Lord, I pray your spirit would roam around in this room. God, would you, would you speak to our hearts the very words that we need in our spirit, Lord? I pray, God, that we would yield to you. I pray against any lie the enemy would have us believe to keep us from coming repentantly to your word. And I pray, God, that you'd move us in boldness into your peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, church, you can be seated. Okay. Um, we are entering into a very complicated passage, <laughs> and I'm going to do my best um, to really try to narrow this down and, and kind of focus on what's happening here, um, but you need to know there's a lot of scholarly debate on this issue. Um, there's a lot of, of, lot of ink spilled on these couple of verses right here in this text today. Um, I'm not going to get into all that kind of stuff. If you're a nerd like me, you can do it. I've got resources for you. I'll show you, okay? You can have some fun with that. Um, but what I want to do is I, I want to focus on the big picture of Paul's argument that he's advancing so far. You guys recognize that Paul is not saying a bunch of detached things from one to the next, yes? He's building an argument. He's moving our minds with him on this journey to explain to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so on your outline, we have a, excuse me, on your notes page, there's an outline trying to keep track of that for you this morning. Um, But here's the thing. Paul is in this, this section talking about sin to reveal to us what he says succinctly in Romans 3.23, which is this. And I want this to be kind of the governing principle that you keep in your mind as we're looking at this text, okay, for the next couple of weeks, which is this. Some of you could quote it from heart. For all, who? All. For? Have sinned and fall short of the glory of God of God, right? Church, Paul is building a theology to both the the, the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people alike of that reality. That's where he's headed. That succinct little statement. Everything he's dealing with right now in all these passages, all the texts we're hammering through, everything is pointing to that reality right there that all have sinned, all, all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now you have to keep that in mind as we delve into these next few passages leading up to that statement, Paul is dealing with a congregation made up of both Jewish believers in Jesus, yes, and Gentile believers, Greeks, okay? These are, these are probably Roman citizens that have come to faith. And in fact, we believe that by the time Romans is written and received in Rome, that it's primarily a Greek audience, okay? It's mainly Gentiles with some Jews sprinkled back in. But he's talking to both of those people. And he's also talking to, he's aware of this reality right here, church, which is, which is fascinating, that there are people who are in that room who are Jews and who are Greeks who have bent the knee to Jesus and are following him, Yes? but he's also understanding that there are Jews and there are Greeks in that room who have not. Paul is preaching to a wider audience. He's he's looking up and saying, listen, I want this gospel message to move from even those of you who are believers in the room to those who are not believers in the room. You with me? And so he's unpacking this text to us uh, for such a thing as that to not only edify us, but to shape the world, church. And so Paul is preaching to a wide audience. And what he's doing, church, is he's explaining the condition of the human heart apart from Christ's saving work. That's what he's unpacking for us. Um, As evidenced through what Paul will be preaching to the Jews, there was a belief among the Jews that because they possess the law, okay, that because they came from Abraham and from Moses, that they're the chosen people of God, that because of that possession of the law, they were good with God, right? Um, I'm a chosen person, therefore it doesn't matter how I live. Hmm, very different today, isn't it? (laughs) Right? 
Uh, because I possess this law, having it means everything. Because I'm Hebrew, because of my ethnicity, I am good with God. That was the understanding among many of the Jews. They felt inherently secure in their salvation simply based on being Jewish alone. Church, that's trusting in their ethnic position instead of trusting in Jesus. Do you see the problem here? Uh, in other words, because they had the law, they were good with God while the rest of the world was damned. That's an issue. What Paul is going to be going to great lengths to demonstrate is that it is not the possession of the law that counts, but adherence to the law. Yeah? See, church, God was after people who would be obedient to him, people who would follow him, people who would know him, people who would yield to him, people who were surrendered to Jesus. Has that changed? <laughs> Come on. No. This raises a huge question then, church. If God intended for the law, for obedience to happen there, for you to keep it, here's the question. Is it possible for a human to keep the law? We're going to be unpacking that for months, so you just stay with me, all right? Uh, another way to put this, is it possible for a human to live up to God's perfect standard? If not, then how can a person be saved? It's a deal, church. Paul is going to be getting to that. But before he does, the thing he must establish is that all of humanity, all of humanity, what does Romans 3.23 say? Have sinned, all of us, and stand condemned in their sin before holy God. Church, he's going to show that God will repay humanity for what they have done. And what humanity has done is sin. There you go. That is all preamble <laughs> to try to get us thinking the same way we're moving here, okay? Um, I want to start actually by where we left off last week in verse 5 of chapter 2. Um, Paul is grounding this argument from here and kind of moving out through there. So um, verse 5 says this, But because... Of your hard and impenitent heart. That's a good thing to describe your heart, isn't it, church? <laughs> hard and impenitent. You are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. We spent a lot of time talking through this last week, didn't we? Church, the wrath of God comes against those with hard and impenitent hearts. Okay? Hearts, that's unfeelingness, that's callousness towards the Lord. Impenitent means non-repentant. I'm not yielded to, I'm not following Jesus. Are you with me? And it says that you are storing up wrath for yourself. When you hear the word storing up, what do you think of? I, I gotta be honest, the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of storing up wrath was uh, like, like doomsday preppers. <laughs> Getting their thing, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> getting their things, stacking them up, like make a little hiding room, stash it full of the stuff, right? What are you doing? Are you going to use it this week? What are you doing with it? You're saving it for later, aren't you? Right? But you're collecting. It's active, isn't it? It's this process of gaining. Um, we do this with our 401k. Yeah? You with me? What are we doing? Putting some money aside now, taking it away, right? I can't use it right now. I'm putting it away actively. Why? So that one day I can use it. Right? If, if the people with hard and impenitent hearts are storing up wrath with themselves, for themselves, think about this. That means there's coming a day when they get to experience it. The, the actions, the works, the deeds, the things done in darkness by those who don't follow Jesus, it's not, listen, we, we sometimes think I'm getting away with this because uh, I'm not experiencing immediate consequence. How many children did that kind of thing as you were kids, Right? I'm getting away with this because I haven't experienced consequence yet. They're storing up the wrath that will be revealed. That's a promise, church. And it's active. Church, another way you could say this is they are actively earning wrath by what they do. Earning, earning wrath by what they do. Um, all those sins listed in chapter one, by the way, who was just blessed by that fun list of sins, yeah? All of those sins 
are working. They're working to do something. And what they're doing is saving up wrath that will be revealed on the judgment day of Christ when God gives the world over to his son. Church, to the person with the hard heart towards the Lord, to the one who refuses to turn to Jesus in repentance, stay with me here. They will spend an eternity in hell. That should sober us. We're not talking about something that's going to be hidden once more, but something that will yet be revealed. That should sober us, church. That's what this verse is saying. Church, we've got to stop thinking about today and start thinking about that day. Come on. If we're honest, we're so caught up in the cares of this world, our our lives, the things that we're trying to do, and carving out a living, which is very hard to do right now. I get that, right? We're worried about what's going on in the world. We've got all these cares and concerns. And and yet the reality is we're promised that that day is coming. And we have people in our lives who that day is coming against and they are unrepentant and they are hard-hearted towards the Lord. And you know what the end is in that text, don't you? We've got to start living for that day, church. Um, It's at this point in the conversation that the Jewish person in the room could be tempted to say, that day's coming for everyone except for me. See where he's going with this. Um, Because I possess the law, because I'm Hebrew, because I'm Jewish, and, and that's my inheritance, then that day is coming. Yes, I'll affirm it. In fact, they very much believe that, don't they? But it's coming for everybody, but it's not coming for me. I'm exempt. I won't spend an eternity in hell even though I have a hard and impenitent heart because I have the law. And this is where Paul wants to do his work to correct, okay? That brings us to our text this morning, verse six, here we go. He, who's the he there, church? God, okay? God will render to each one according to his works, Just pause right there. Right out of the gate, Paul's actually quoting scripture. Okay? Um, What he's quoting comes from Psalm 62, 12, where God says that he will render to everyone what is owed him, what is due based on how he lives. That's, That's an Old Testament theme that Paul is picking up on as he's weaving this in here. Um, Church, by quoting from Psalms here, What Paul is doing is he's saying to his Jewish audience, listen, I'm not making something up, okay? This is something that finds its place throughout the Old Testament, that God is going to repay evil for evil, yes? That God is going to vindicate the righteous, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. I'm not making something up. And that verse in Psalm 62, 12 says he will do it to each person, each. Not just the nations, but all of humanity. Church, he's using the word render. That word is a technical word that means to reward or punish, whether tangibly or intangibly, based upon what a person deserves. Render. To reward or punish based on what somebody deserves. This is a, this is a, it's a very concrete theological word that he's using. He's going to render judgment. And it's based on what you deserve. What's being stored up, yes? Church, Paul is going to introduce grace in chapter four and we're going to dance and we're going to celebrate (laughs) because we're going to get this. We're going to get that grace is not cheap. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Wrath is getting very much what we do. Right here, Paul is asserting that God will pay people back for what they have done. In other words, we will reap what we have sown. Are you with me so far? Church, what's Paul trying to communicate? Main theme. 
that each person has built up a debt of sin that God will call us to give an account for. All have sinned, and because of that sin, punishment will be made out. Amen? All right. Now, Paul's going to continue by painting a picture of two type of people for us, okay? I want you to pay attention to this. Verse 7. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. First thing I want you to see right here, church, is the promises made there. He will give eternal life and there will be wrath and fury. If we believe there's gonna be eternal life, we have to believe the same opposite promise, which is there will be eternal destruction. Do you see that? Church, when we first read this text, it can be easy to mischaracterize the two sketches of people, if you will, um, like this. We're kind of over, overly reductionistic and, and we come to this conclusion that the person who does good things will go to heaven. Yes? The person who does good things will go to heaven. The person who does bad things will go to hell, right? So we kind of generalize this statement. That's what it sounds like. After all, God will repay people for what they do, correct? Church, this is works-based salvation. Um, this is those who do good things will get good things and those who do bad things will get bad. That's called karma, church. Karma. What does Christianity actually teach? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And did you know that many <laughs> of our brothers throughout church history have added apart from works to that statement? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Church, when we read this text as though it is talking about people who do good things and therefore deserve salvation, we are saying that salvation is by works alone. You see that? Church, that is heresy. It's heresy. So how should we read this text? Should we try to get Paul to mean something different? Do we have to do gymnastogesis to get around it? I don't think we need to, church. Paul is contrasting two types of people here, two ways of existence, and he goes on, verse nine, look at this. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. Oh, and then he clarifies in case you're sitting there thinking you're going to get out of this mess, to the Jew first and also the Greek. By everyone he means everyone. Verse 10, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. I want to compile a list contrasting these two things. This helps me when I'm preparing. And so I want you to see the sketch number one is this first type of person. Notice the phrases used to describe them. Um, patience in well-doing. You could translate that as per persevering in good works, okay? This is the person who perseveres in good works, right? They seek glory and honor and immor immortality that says they will get eternal life. It also says they will get glory and honor and peace, praise God. And it says that they do good. Those are all phrases taken out of that text, okay? Uh, the second type of person, the second sketch here, is the person who is what? Self-seeking, right? Self-seeking. Disobedient to truth. Obedient, on the other hand, to unrighteousness, that's sin, will get wrath and fury. There's something that's going to gain for them. They will also get tribulation and distress, and they will do evil. You see the parallels here in this text. 
Yes, he's contrasting what's happening, church. When you're having a contrast like this, what's fascinating is that the opposites for each are true. So the person who's persevering in doing good is not self-seeking. What does that mean? They're one who seeks God. They're not disobedient to truth. They're what? Obedient to truth, right? And they don't obey unrighteousness. What do they do? They disobey unrighteousness, right? They've submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Church, what I think we're talking about here is that the person on the right is the person who, as Romans one twenty five says, has exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Church, this is self-seeking. This is self-seeking worship. This is the one who trades what God has plainly revealed for a lie. This is one who's disobedient to the truth and obedient to sin. He's talking about the person under wrath. But church, the first type of person is one who has not exchanged the truth of God for a lie. It's a person who instead is obedient to the truth. Church, this is a person then out of Paul's own argument as he's building this thing along, this is a person who has a soft and repentant heart. Not one who is hard and impenitent. Church, this person described in this text right here I believe is a person who has turned to Jesus. That faith is the origin of the way they are now living their life. Amen? Um, What Paul is doing in verse 7 is actually paralleling the teaching of Jesus from his parables about the good soil. You guys remember this parable? It's four different types of soil that are listed, right? Some that's rocky and the, the seed can't grow there. Some that's planted along the path. It gets trampled and scorched by the sun. Some that's planted and starts to grow, but weeds come in and choke it out. You guys with me so far? Then he says this in verse 15. Listen to the qualities of what Jesus defines here and think about the first person in that sketch we just did. It says, as for that in the good soil, the word that's sown into the good soil, the good soil being a person, Yes? They are those who, hearing the word, obedient to truth, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, heart, and bear fruit with patience. That's what he's talking about right here. I think Paul is absolutely calling to a reality of somebody who is a believer. Church, doesn't that sound familiar to what we just read? Right? Paul is talking about believers here. The believers are those who hear the word of God and believe it so that it causes repentance in their heart. They turn from their sin and they turn towards Jesus. Amen? This is a work of the Holy Spirit of God, church, preserving, persevering in good works as they follow Jesus Christ. Church, the only way to gain glory and honor and immortality is through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. How many people today are trying to live forever by doing all the right things for their bodies? Come on. How's it working? They're they're persevering in well-doing, yes? Like, how's it working? The only way to receive glory and honor and immortality is through faith in Jesus Christ. Church, the good works are the evidence of what God has done in the heart, not the opposite. Remember what Paul's trying to prove here, that God is just in his judgment of sinners, yes? Church, the details on how the gospel saves through faith will be made extremely clear as Paul continues to advance this argument. I'm giving you the the little setup to where he's going. He's nodding at it, but he's not saying it yet. But for now, Paul is showing that God is just in his judgment of sin because all people will receive what they seek from God in their lives. Those who seek immortality and glory and honor will receive everlasting life. Come on. 
And those who seek themselves will receive everlasting judgment. God is fair. Church says this right after that. In fact, verse 11, for God shows no partiality. There it is. God shows no partiality. Church, what's Paul saying here? Robert Yarbrough says this, however someone lives, however they live, and whatever the outcome, God will have been fair in his assessment of what that person and his activities on the day of judgment because he shows no partiality. God is not unrighteous to judge sin. God is righteous to judge sin. Amen? Church, God is not holding some people to one standard and then holding others to another. <laughs> He's not saying, you all don't have to do that, but you guys have to, okay? I mean, I mean, think about this. In that congregation with Jews and Gentiles, there's a divide going on here. One who thinks we don't have to do anything for the Lord. We're already God's people. And these people who are doing everything they can for the Lord, you see what I'm saying? God's, God does not show partiality, church, because he is righteous. Um, we've been using this word righteous throughout our conversation in Romans so far, and the, the word again is diakasune. Righteousness is measuring up to God's perfect standard. That's the measure, yes? Church, God is not requiring some to measure up while excusing the rest. That's not how salvation works. Because God is just. And so Paul goes on to explain, verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Church, look at what Paul is saying here. Those who do not have the law and do not live by the law will all perish, yes? This flows exactly out of what he's been talking about the entire time. He's consistent here. Whether or not you heard, therefore knew the law, right? There's still guilt there. Because the point is keeping the law. Can you keep it? Church, if you lived without the law, and remember when Paul's writing to Greeks, they would not have had the law. And if you sinned apart from that law, you are condemned by it. Nonetheless. And church, the same is true, he's saying, for the Jews. Though they had the law, though they heard it, though it was in their ears, though they would preach it and they would hear it and they would memorize it, though they had the law, hearing the law was not the same thing as keeping it, church. That's the problem. They're supposed to live it, and yet they're failing to do so. And because of that, Paul's saying they will perish just like the Gentile who has never even heard of the law. So the question we have to wrestle with is, how is it fair for God to condemn Gentiles who don't hear the law? Or we could put it in our context today, tribes in Africa who don't have the Bible in their language. How is that fair? We get that it's fair for someone who's been warned not to do it, yes? That when they, in fact, break it, they deserve it. Are you with me? That's on them. But how fair is it for God to judge Gentiles by it? Look what he says, verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires... Do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Right there, church. That's why it's fair for God to judge the Gentiles apart from the law, because there are Gentiles who by nature do what the law requires. While they have not heard the law, they are keeping it Church, when Paul uses the word nature, what he's not talking about is human nature there. He's not talking about our our corrupted self because of sin. Um, In the context of his flow of thought, remember what he's been talking about in Romans 1, that God is the God who's revealed himself through creation, yes? That's nature, isn't it? 
that through God's natural revelation, there are those who seek him and seek to obey him. That's why he's just in condemnation because he has, as he says in Romans 1, made himself plain. He's revealed who he is, church, through nature. Church, this is what Paul says in Romans 1.19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Church, through God's general revelation in nature comes accountability to what God has shown so that all are equal. God is just in his judgment of humanity. Church, God has woven into creation his existence. He has shown the law to the Gentiles through what he's created. God has revealed himself, church. But notice here, it doesn't just say that those who know the law in verse 14, it says those who by nature do what the law requires. There's a change there. There's something different going on. Verse 15. This is how someone can do what the law requires, by the way. They show, they show, the word means reveal, they demonstrate where it's coming from. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Church, Paul says they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. If Paul would have added quotation marks here (laughs) back in that era, he couldn't get more clear than what he's doing here, church. I told you earlier that the person who's obedient to the law, the person who's following, the person that seeks honor and glory and immortality is the person who is a believer. And here's exactly why I think that, church. Because Paul is not making something up here. He's quoting something very old. He's quoting from Jeremiah 31, 33, which says this, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. He's talking about the new covenant declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Church, in Jeremiah, for three chapters surrounding this text, he's talking about the new covenant where God pours out his spirit on humanity so that once, finally, their heart can be transformed so they can obey Jesus. Come on. Church, he's talking about believers here. Paul is quoting this passage of scripture explicitly speaking of the new covenant, a covenant mediated by the power of the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus Christ. Church, Paul is talking about believers in Jesus. What God has been working throughout redemptive history was this moment fulfilled in Christ, the giving of this new covenant. Church, under the old covenant, people could not keep the law, could they? Failure after failure after failure again and again and again yielded the reality they could not keep the law. But under the new covenant, the power of the Spirit transforms the heart of a believer so that we are obedient to Jesus. Church, the Jews thought that they were good with God because they had the law. Church, having the law means nothing unless you have the law written on your heart. Your obedience to the law, your performance of works is useless to save you unless your heart has been transformed by the creator of the universe. It means nothing. So here's where this meets us, church. And I want you to wrestle with this in this moment. That was a lot of complicated stuff. Has your heart been made new? Do you have the law of God written on your heart? 
do you trust in Jesus? Do you know how you can know if that's true of you? One of the proofs, church, that our heart has been made new is right here in this text, verse 15. It says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. Church, reflect on this deeply today. Does your conscience bear witness that you are a son and daughter of Most High God? Is it telling you again and again that I've been bought and I have been sealed by the Spirit of God? And in, in Romans 8, he's going to talk expressly about that the Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. Church, are you a son and daughter of God? Does your conscience tell you that you belong to Jesus? I'm asking you to get real with this today. I'm not asking you to overlook this church. I'm asking you this to really discern whether or not you belong to Jesus. Does your, does your conscience tell you you belong to Jesus or does it tell you otherwise? Because notice what it says in the next part. Their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Church, if your conscience is under accusation from within, if your spirit is not bearing witness to your salvation, then you must listen. Because here's why. Because there's coming a day when according to Paul's gospel, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, church, God judges the secrets. The secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Church, God knows the truth of your heart. He knows your secrets. He knows if you've just been looking like you're surrendered or if you're actually surrendered. God knows whether or not you're showing up here on a Sunday morning looking like you believe in Jesus with a heart that does not belong to him. Church, God knows that. And in his mercy, in his grace, in his kindness, he plants his spirit to speak that word to us. And so let me ask you again, does your conscience bear witness that you are a son or a daughter of God? You're not going to get away with faking it with God. Church, the Jews thought they were good with God because they had the law. They thought if they faked keeping it, that, that faking it would be enough, that we just got to look like we're clean, even though we're not. We just have to act the right part. Church, Christian, there are many people who know how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And I mean that. They're walking like they know. They're talking like they know. Meanwhile, a heart is far from God. The heart that denies the truth, a heart that is hardened and unrepentant towards the Lord. Church, there are people every Sunday who come to church who think they are good with God just because they go to church. I'm doing the right things. I've taken the name Christian. I have a label. The Jews had a label too. What the Jews needed was not a label, they needed a savior. Church, there are people who are trusting in their own works to get them into heaven. Some of you in this room right now, you've been trusting in your own effort, your own ability, your own reason, thinking that you're storing up for yourself life, eternal immortality, glory and honor, when in fact, if your heart does not belong to him, you are storing up wrath. So let me ask you today, church, do you know that you are good with God? Do you know that? I'm asking to ask yourself, seek your heart. Ask the spirit of God to reveal that truth to you today. Do you know you're good with God? Do you know that you believe? Do you know that you've surrendered? If your conscience bears witness in your spirit that you belong to Jesus, then you start praising God today. Thank him. Glorious truth.
But if your answer is no, then today is the day to soften your heart and to ask his spirit to write his law upon your heart today. If your answer is no, today is the day for salvation. God will give eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I pray against self-deception today. I pray against self-seeking. I pray against the denial of truth. Instead, God, what I ask for is a revelation of truth to our hearts. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room today who are following Jesus, that you would affirm and you would, you would hold fast, God. You'd make it known. There'd be joy in their heart because they are a son and daughter of the Most High God. Lord, I pray that assurance would break out all over the room for those who are yours. But God, I pray in your grace. I pray in your kindness. I pray in the name of your mercy that for those in this room who do not belong to you, that in Jesus' name right now, you would prick their heart with the truth of the gospel, that you would tell them, Lord, if they're far from you. God, that their conscience would not rest easy in self-deception, in self-seeking, or in denying the truth. But God, today, you would reveal your truth to them in Jesus' name. That God, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That we stand under the just condemnation of holy God. God, we can't keep the law. We can't do good works to save ourselves. Or for the person struggling with that today who thinks I'm doing all the right things, therefore I must be good with God. I pray today for the spirit of God to illuminate the reality of their heart. Not by works so that no one can boast, Lord, but by the spirit. I pray, Jesus, for repentance in Jesus' name. God, I praise you for your call, Lord Jesus, that you don't stand there watching us idly by, store away wrath for ourselves that one day we'll get, we get the full payment of God. You don't stand by just letting us be self-deceived all the way to the grave, but that you give us your word, that you speak your truth, that you convict, that your spirit comes in and says, listen, you're going the wrong direction. I praise you for that. And so would today be the day of salvation for many as deception falls off and the gospel illuminates the truth. Lord God, would you save, would you call names today? Church, if God has called your name today, if you, you recognize that in your heart as you've been in this sermon and dealing with this text today and through this prayer, if God is calling your heart today, do not turn away from that. Don't be ashamed of that. You might've been going to church for 50 years of your life and today is the day that Jesus saved you. Do not be ashamed of that. Praise him for his mercy. Praise him for his grace. Don't let your pride hide that from, from your heart. follow. I want to trust, Lord. If that's you today, then I'm, in, I'm begging you, come talk to me after this service. Don't hide away. Don't be ashamed. Don't be in fear. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to rejoice with you. Just like heaven screams in joy when a sinner repents because of the power of the gospel. Don't turn away from that today. Lord God, we love you. We praise you for your holy word. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Holy, holy Jesus. We praise your name.